Okay, so uh, hey gang, it's Harold. Uh, found myself here with uh, the great Lee Brimmican Wood and uh, my friend Volko Runka, and we're going to talk about Lee's background and, and his history and um, his, uh, his fantastic game, Burning Blue, which Volko and I have been playing in the summer a great deal. So Lee, thanks for joining us. I appreciate you taking the time. No problem. There are far too many superlatives in, there, in that introduction. <laughs> well, I have more, so just wait. Um, but, uh, you know, as I, as I looked at your background, Lee, it was interesting to me that you spend a great deal of your time, uh, your professional time, in video games. Uh, so could you tell us a little bit about what you do and, and what you've done, and has it been aviation-related? Oh, uh, yes. Uh, to answer is to both of those questions. So... Um, I got into the video games business by accident. Um, I'm trying to think now. It's t late twenties years ago. I, somewhere in the early mid nineties, it happened. I, I, I've actually lost track of the date. I, I had written a book about the movie Aliens, and uh, written and illustrated this this thing called the Aliens Colonial Marines Technical Manual. And it got me a gig working for um, uh, a, a company called Rebellion, a studio that's still running, um, does a lot of games like Sniper Elite. Uh, but back then they were doing uh, first-person shooters and they had produced a, a game called Aliens vs. Predator for the Atari Jaguar. And uh, I was hired to basically be sort of an advisor. But I suddenly realized that you know, there's an awful lot of stuff from my sort of wargaming career um, I say career, it wasn't really a career at that point, but just from the wargaming hobby uh, that I could kind of leverage and, and carry into um, uh, you know, the computer games industry. And so I kind of uh, bullshat my way into uh, a much more long running gig at, at that studio and starting to do actual design for them. Uh, actual game design and uh, it sort of all went from there really uh, so I was at Rebellion for a while I then left and joined another company called uh, that time was called Simis who were known for, as a studio that did a lot of flight simulators and they had created a piece of software called the flight simulation toolkit and this was sort of all this is all old school this is all back in the days when I think uh, talented amateurs could still make their way into the business. Uh, I don't think that's really possible now. I mean, when I, I look at all, when I interview for, for roles, everybody's, um, they've all got degrees in games development and they're all these astonishing multi-talented youngsters who can code and can art and can design and, uh, and I feel somewhat inadequate next to them. But, you know, back then I, 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 could, uh, I, I could make my way in, my, my sort of uh, aviation knowledge and war games knowledge and all this kind of thing came into a series of games that I was worked on. I did some uh, helicopter flight sims, uh, uh, Team Apache, uh, KA-52 Team Alligator. I then uh, went on and did a, a train simulator. Uh, so I worked on, worked on a Microsoft train simulator for a while. Um, then went off and did a whole, I basically worked in lots of other genres. I, I've worked on um, a turn-based tactics game. I did a licensed D&D game. Uh, I've worked on first-person shooters in various IPs. I worked on a Warhammer 40K game called um, Fire Warrior, which was a first-person shooter, which was enormous fun. And uh, I kind of went on from there, really. Um, done a, a, a lot of, again, I seem to come back to first-person shooters, but I've worked on some big IPs. Um, I worked on the uh, Killzone IP, um, Killzone Mercenary, Killzone Shadowfall I did work for. Um, worked for Ubisoft on the Far Cry franchise, uh, worked on Far Cry 3, and uh, worked in a variety of, of design roles, um, everything from systems design to uh, content design all sorts of things and uh, I was wor working until relatively recently in a studio called uh, Supermassive making narrative games um, some of those will be coming out uh, in fact one coming out very soon little hope uh, I left them in the early stages of the pandemic and I'm now at a new studio called Absolutely Games and I can't talk about what we're working on but I will say that uh, when you guys hear about it I think you'll be interested terrific uh, could you tell if it's if it's aviation oriented? Uh, I cannot say anything about that. I find it safest just not to talk about whatever 
whatever I'm working on until we make an official announcement. It's just safest that way. Fair enough. And I also find it most interesting if I pry, so I apologize. Um, no, it's all right. I'll, I'll just stonewall you. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. So, so Lee, you, you have, if we look at your resume of board games, you clearly have an interest in aviation, a love for aviation. Mm -hmm. um, where does that come from? I'm not sure. Uh, Schoolboy stuff, really. Um, you know, uh, interested in it from a very early age. Um, you know, grew up in the 60s and 70s when there's still an awful lot of you know memory of the of World War Two around, and so you know uh, uh, nostalgia for you know uh, hurricanes and Spitfires and and you know all that kind of thing uh, caught me at an early age. Plus, of course, you know, I was living in the relatively early stages of the jet age. So, um, you know, all these kind of rocket shaped planes like F-104 Starfighters were, were interesting me. I mean, it, it wasn't exclusively um, aviation. I mean, I do have an interest in other areas of warfare, but um, it just seems to have been when it comes to the the games career, that was, that's an area that I, I seem to have had a big focus on. Uh, I sort of fell into groups of people who did a lot of aviation gaming and were like me very very interested in the subject and so uh so people like jd webster for example who designed a whole bunch of games um uh, air superiority and the, the spin-offs from that like um airstrike and speed of heat and i you know got very friendly with him very chummy with him still am and um so worked on uh, really worked with uh you know I wouldn't say worked on designing anything on his games, but it certainly was like a booster for them and did some bits of research, which I threw in his direction. Uh, same goes for his World War II fighting wing system. And also worked with Tony Valley on the Birds of Prey game system. And uh, that's, uh, you know, which was a very interesting experience. So, yeah, yeah, sort of done an awful lot of, um, before I kind of spun off and started doing my own thing, um, had worked on quite a lot of, you know, or played an awful lot of aviation games and worked on, on, on various titles. Sorry, the sound has cut yeah. out. Yeah, my fault, uh, muted. I've done this enough to know better, but. Uh, <laughs> the, the, so that's pretty much that it. <laughs> That's through much of the classic days of, uh, of SPI, Avalon Hill. Um, one, of, one of my favorites, not because it was a good game, but because it just had immense detail, was Air War. Did oh, Lord, we played Air War. Um, oh, God, we played a hell of a lot of Air War back in the day. I mean, I was, I think I was doing my O-levels and um, at, at the time, which were like my high school exams. And we were playing, we were playing all the scenarios, we were playing all the really complicated ones as well. And so, uh, yeah, we, we pushed that one to its limit and kind of run into what the limits were and, and realized there was a lot of things that run satisfactory about that design and we're looking for the next thing. Eventually it sort of came along in the mid eighties with air super superiority and then uh, sort of went from there really. Right, right. Well, I, I have some questions as to how that influenced your design approach to Burning Blue, but uh, we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the, the design influences on, on the Burning Blue actually come from other, uh, uh, another direction, but we, we'll talk about that, I'm sure, in right. a bit. Right, very good. So, so you also have a, a skill for graphics. As I look back through your resume, uh, uh, your, your board game resume, of course, um, at least Board Game Geek tells me it starts with, uh, with uh, Downtown, right, in, in yes. 2004. But, but you've also been involved in a lot of games that you didn't design doing the graphics or doing some portion of the graphics. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, it goes back, you know, further than that. And certainly with some of my involvement with things like um, Birds of Prey was doing graphics. Um, and then subsequently as well, I've done a bunch of games. I worked on the Combat Commander games and uh, Unhappy King Charles and various things. Angola, I think I did the graphics for. So, um, Yes, uh, been an I've worked as an illustrator in the past. Um, it was one of my one of my jobs at one stage before I, I got into the games industry. As a, uh, as I say, I sort of illustrated books and magazines and various things. And so, uh, yes, um, I, when I learned how to wrangle um, software tools, um, I was kind of up and away, really. So you were involved in. Um 
Well, let's, let's start with, since it's ground oriented, and I know Volko has a love for the game as well, let's talk about co Combat Commander. How did you get rallied into that, uh, that process? I honestly can't recall. Um, I think I was approached, it might have been by um, uh, 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 Tony Curtis at um, GMT. It was one of the GMT people who I think got in touch and said, you know, do you want to get involved with this? And so I, I, I did. Um, and, uh, you know, so I ended up doing a whole bunch of them. I think I did it up to Pacific. Uh, and it was kind of hard work. Um, is it, it, it was an interesting, interesting project, that one. Um, because I, I'm not sure I'm a fan of the game. Um, I think there are issues with it, but I, I recognize that it's very, very popular. And, um, the, you know, the graphics I was trying to do were very, very simple and stark, um, and were designed really to be viewed very, very tiny, which was always a little bit galling when somebody went and blew them up to large size because they look horrible at large size. They're not meant to look good at large size. They're meant to look good tiny. So... Volko, do you have some observations on uh, Combat Commander? Uh, yeah, well, I um, I actually like them blown up as well. So there you go. Uh, oh, you're, you're a sick, sick man. <laughs> yeah, I, do, do. Shall I try uh, the screen sharing? Yeah, let's here? let's uh, let's give it a go. Yeah. Get around it if it doesn't, because I wanted to um, actually ask a kind of a series of questions about lots of particulars of just art and so let's see if if the sure. technology cooperates or not here so let me know if you can see this it's a, it started screen sharing voco that's a good sign that's progress <laughs> oh all right okay yes yes i can see now so and this is a uh, just a photograph uh, from Board Game Geek, and it's of course from the Burning Blue, the detection deck, and there are just so many details here uh, that are that are wonderful, both functionally and in terms of, of of beauty. But the I wanted to ask you in particular about the back of this card because it's so uh, evocative and it really is unique. Can you talk about the the concept of that card back? Uh, yes, I, um, I'm trying to remember the process by which I came up with that, but um, somebody, somebody who I've fallen out with did actually, I think, partly have a poke at me a long time ago talking about my games as being art projects. <laughs> and uh, uh, I kind of, um, I've kind of cut him off as a consequence of that, but um, there is an element of truth to it, which is a lot of my games really start with me imagining what it looks like and uh so yes i get kind of quite quite excited about the graphics and the things that i can do and um yeah the, for the backs of the card you know i wanted a, a uh, to grab i think it was a section of uh dialogue um that i think was taken from it was meant to be taken from an actual uh, exchange um, from pilots in the Battle of Britain or from a pilot and uh, so you know take that dialogue exchange and put it on the back and have this very, very stark image of the, the, the DO-17 going down in flames you know it's quite a famous picture so I was just kind of you know recreating and, and tracing a quite well-known photograph in this particular case but yeah it kind of came out quite nicely didn't it it really did. And for me, when you read the words, of course, the game has 200 plus and vector and angels. And once you play the game, you know what all these strange words mean. And then there's also Carfax and snappers. And it's just so um, uh, immersive. I mean, you read that and you're like, what an adventure I, I want to get into when I play this. Game. I think something that's, that's always interested me is... Um... Uh, you know, I think a lot of Americans are very aware of the of the the, the Monty Python sketch about the, the the banter, the Battle of Britain banter, and so on. But you know, the, it kind of reflected some sort of truth in the fact that a lot of these were very very young lads. I mean, one one friend of mine who fought in the battle, um, he was twenty at the time, and he'd actually joined his squadron at the age of nineteen. I mean, these really young guys, um, and so they had. Um, you know, they were full of you know the slang of the era and obviously the service itself 
affected this kind of rakish slang to it and, and terminology and all sorts of you know code words and uh, and things just sort of made their way into the language some of which were official and some of which less so uh, and and you know you wanted to get a little bit of that snappy um, feel to it I mean I, there's all sorts of little things I shoveled into this game I mean as far as I'm aware it's the only war game that has football scores in it <laughs> right. Yeah, because actually that was quite important to me to note what the football scores were on the 14th of September 1940. And there are there are cricket references, is that right? I don't know the game at all, but is that right? Or because there's something about opening bat and so forth. Oh and yes, cricket. I mean I think that the titles of the scenarios are all all kind of cricketing terms. So cricketing so, terms, uh, yeah. So, anyone, um, anyone who's you know like uh, you know British or Indian, Australian or, or whatever, it's, it's only you heathens on on the left side of the Atlantic who don't understand any of this stuff. <laughs> yeah. Well, I am well, I, very curiously, when I sort of travelled around um, on Microsoft's dime, sort of doing research on American railroads, it was always interesting to kind of turn up at these strange little um, uh, towns in Pennsylvania where the railroads ran through. And you realise that, you know, almost every one of these little towns had a cricket ground. And it was been established by the sort of British engineers who'd gone over there and helped build the railroads and uh, and, and were playing cricket. Um, oh. uh, but obviously it's all, all that's disappeared now. I mean, you know, uh, you had quite a, quite a strong amateur um, cricket uh, uh, tradition in America right up until the early part of the 20th century. I don't think it's survived into modern Virginia, I'm afraid to say. Here's a, a, another one if that shows up. Uh, uh, of course, also burning blue, and it's just the counter sheet for some of the Luftwaffe. Uh, and a number of things jump out at me, but I wanted to ask you about yellow for, for, the, for the Germans in World War II, because that's not very common. Where does that come from? Uh, I, I just dislike intensely an awful lot of the iconography we tend to use in, in, in war games. I mean, you know, let's make the, the Germans gray Let's make them, you know, everything's bloody Feldgrau. You know, I, I, I've had enough of that. Sorry. Um, it, it's, um, uh, for, for, if nothing else, it's just dull. It's incredibly dull to look at. And, and as we know, the, the, you know, the Germans did adopt yellow on the noses of their aircraft basically as a, a, a for um, anti sort of flak recognition to, so that the, uh, that their flat crews wouldn't fly, fire at the yellow nosed aircraft you can and, make it out it on just the seemed appropriate on this sheet here it looks like with the 109s right here you can see the yellow on the note oh yeah yeah you can, there's a little bit of yellow on the spinner or something like that and i think you you notice it's on the underside of the cowling and now that so uh, it, it just seemed you know it was a bright color um it was apropos for uh, you know aviation i've carried that on through a whole bunch of games there's, there's uh -huh. many games that i now use the same the, sort of um, slightly ochre yellow was it the air crews or the ground crews coveralls? Sort of a tawny yellow. At least if you watch uh, the Britain movie, it looks like it looks like they are. I'm not sure. I think um, I think it might be more of sort of like a tan color or a sand color, yeah, but uh, I could yeah. be wrong. So going, if you one thing I liked also about those Luftwaffe counters is the nationality is this light cross symbol in the background. And I noticed here with Combat Commander, they got they have a sort of jaunty little tilt to them. Is that is oh, that? Yeah. Oh, oh yes, yeah, so it was all, all deliberate. It annoys people immensely. I remember when I, I oh, saw does it? first. Oh yeah, I did the I did the did the art, and there's there there is uh, put these little watermarks in the background, and there's uh, there's definitely a crowd on on online and in the usual places, Consume World or wherever, who will, who will whinge about them, uh, and I don't care. <laughs> Um, but yes, the, the, uh, I think the more interesting thing is actually the, uh, the, the characters themselves and, um, and some of the other details on these, these particular counters. I mean, first of all is, you know, going for the, you know, two counters for half squads, um, uh, sorry, two figures for half squads, uh, four figures for full squads. I mean, clearly we're in the same territory as advanced squad leader, but, you know, we're filing the serial numbers off and calling it original. Uh, you know, we, we know what the the, um, the antecedents are here. Uh, I think the di difference I went I, I went for on these was I didn't want to have um, I didn't want to have the usual kind of like shooty action poses on these things. Uh, I, I, I wanted to do, wanted to do something different, um, and I, I'd been working 
on a design that's never come out, but it's, uh, I did some graphics for it, uh, something that me and Charles Vasey were discussing over the years. We were a, a, a bulge game, which it still goes under the working title of Storm of Stuff, since we haven't actually got a, a proper title for it. <laughs> and uh, I, was, I was trying to do some sort of this, this art in, uh, in this style for, for that. Um, and one of the things I quite like about it is, again, it's, it's designed to work small. It's designed to be the sort of very chiaroscuro style, lots of uh, dense spot blacks, so that you really, because you can't, you can't see much detail at this level of reduction. And so um, you, we want to show um, just the masses, you know, the lights and the darks. And uh, so I mean, that's part of the style. But the other thing I wanted to, wanted to do was have something that was a lot more relaxed. Um, I, th I think more of sort of like the Bill Maldin um, characters mm -hmm. that you see in, in, in up front of these, these dog faces are all like these kind of like shabby guys with their asses hanging out and they're, uh, you know, shuffling along as, as unsoldierly as possible. And I thought, well, that's actually what, you know, these guys really look like, whatever army they're in. Um, and they, they weren't in, you know, spiffy uniforms or whatever. So, yeah, let's just have them slouching around and shambling along um, in and also towards the camera and not going to the side. So we get to see these guys coming at you. I, I just thought it was a more interesting angle. Yeah, and um, more, more like what they're probably look like most of the time. So, yeah, yeah they're advancing at you, these guys, um, not necessarily. Speaking of relaxed. Yeah. Very interested in this, these depictions of uh, African soldiers in Angola. You want to talk? You must have done some research for this. Oh God, yes, you had to because uh, there's no way you could take uh, you could take a um, you know a, a, a reference pic of a Western soldier and and Africanize it. Oh, you could try. It would just look terrible. It would look horrible, horrible, horrible. And and so I, I went around. I was looking for reference, and and yeah. You, these guys well first of all they're they're built differently in some ways i mean you know some of these these soldiers are much rangier looking they don't carry quite as much weight as perhaps as some of the uh, uh you know european soldier does uh, but they carry themselves differently as well and they carry their weapons differently and so i tried to try as much as possible to get that um you know that kind of African feel to it. And again, here playing with the colors as well, very bright colors, primaries. I, I did scroll into somebody online the other day who sort of said, well, they kind of started to hurt my eyes after a while. And I'm, okay. But um, I still think that uh, to, I, I wanted that African feel to come out in the color, the brightness of the color, the contrast with the other colors and the contrast with the map. So uh, that's one of the reasons I went, went for those choices. Well, they're, uh, they're beautiful to play with. And I've spent so many days and hours uh, Angola with these counters. And the last one I wanted to share is the, uh, the cards for the same game. And just my personal favorite is right in the middle of that truck, which has clearly seen better days. And uh, I don't know if you know the movie Sorcerer with uh, Roy Scheider, but it's these unfortunate uh, fellows whose job is to repair these ancient trucks and take them through the jungle to carry nitroglycerin to a well fire. And this truck here always reminds me of these gigantic uh, jalopies navigating the jungle, jungle trails. Yeah, I, I'm familiar with the original French movie as well. Uh, I'm familiar with the original French movie, Wages of Fear. Yes, the, uh, uh, the, 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 as you say, they have seen better days, these things. But again, <laughs> it's, uh, there's something quite nice about the unmilitary poses in some cases. Um, of these figures i i you know there's, there's something fascinates me about that yeah and so are the uh, the soldiers on the right are they um, trying to track the enemy or are they playing craps it's kind of hard to tell <laughs> i think they're just like like you know crouching down in in cover and again it's this this lovely pose that you don't normally everybody wants to do sort of like you know john wayne action poses for uh, characters in uh, when they they draw them for games, and um, I, I I quite like these these things that don't look like that, okay. unexpected. You know, I think part of the issue is that people often start with the miniatures, right? They start with a painted miniature and then trace or draw behind that. Um, I would suspect you didn't you did nothing of the kind. Um, I actually, you know, I did work from photo reference. Um, there were I think a few of those ones have been traced. Uh, from photo reference, you know, and doctored and played around with 
but uh, you know some were original as well. I mean, if you want to see some more original work, um, a good one good one is possibly um, Unhappy King Charles, which has quite a lot of my my you know that's that's my line drawings in, so that's my pen art rather than uh, digital art in there. And um, again, I think that was that was also quite fun to do. I mean, again, I was I, I was you know going from reference where possible, but you you, you could have a lot of fun with uh, uh, the, the the English Civil War. Yes, <laughs> yes, lots of colors. The um, it, it's terrific to see that and and to see that connection. Um, you know, I, I suspect that Mark Simonich is uh, is so good at what he does because he starts with the art. Uh, of course, it's maps for him, but uh, mm -hmm. but I you know I think that that starting there really creates a very different product. Um, yeah, I, mean, I think there's, there's definitely an element of my process where, uh, um, you know, I think of what the game is going to look like being played, or I think of a nice graphical motif that I want to employ it. And then I won't say the game design revolves around that, but I, I, it does become very much integrated into the whole process of, right, okay, these are the physical components. And then, you know, the, the, the some game processes flow for, out from that. And it becomes a bit of a, a, a a circle of figuring how the graphics and the game design um, intermix. Certainly. Well, I'd be embarrassed to show you my graphics, so so we won't. Um, it, so once again, you know, uh, Board Game Geek tells me that 2004 and, and Downtown was your first design. Did you did you have a design before this, or did you work on any other designs? Um, as I say, I'd sort of done some noodling around on other things. I'd worked with Tony Valley on Birds of Prey. Um, uh, I didn't work on the final version of that, so uh, it did evolve after I left working on that that particular project. Um, but uh, you know, yes, I, I sort of was involved in some other bits and pieces. But let, let, let's say for the let's make it nice and easy and just say that really the career began. I mean, you say 2004. I, I've lost track of the dates for some reason. For, for me, it's, it's earlier than that. But really, the game that game got kicked off uh, late 2001. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a after uh, after 9/11 um, that mm -hmm. I started work on that. Right. So and, I, I think of it very much as you know 2002 onwards before that thing came out. Right. And and why uh, why start with Vietnam for your first game? Um, because I had been working on Birds of Prey, we'd been working on a dogfight simulator, um, and I think that I was kind of quite interested in how do we get the larger scale battle, and you know I was looking around for a subject matter to sort of start interrogating that, you know, the the, the BVR battle and um, you know, uh, beyond visual range battle and uh, and so on. And, and sort of raids at a larger scale uh, rather than the dogfight. And, um, you know, Vietnam seemed to sort of present itself as an obvious obvious solution. Plus, there was a game that had, uh, I mean, you guys may well have seen it from back in the day. There's a game from many, many moons ago called Rolling Thunder. Mm -hmm. And it was a horrible game. It was, uh, oh, my goodness me, it's, it's, it's a candidate for the trash. But it had these kind of like quite beautiful graphics in it that kind of grabbed my eye. And it was like, oh, right, okay, I quite like some of those graphics. And, um, and so I thought, oh, okay, I was kind of steal some of those graphical ideas. And then, you know, that sort of like, again, was an inspiration for taking it on and, ma and making a game. So, uh, yeah, yeah, that, that was, uh, that sort of propelled me into, into doing Vietnam. And uh, that was kind of an entertaining game. A lot of people told me it would never sell, and it, and it did. So, there. Yeah. So, Lee, you said something important that I want to ask you a little bit more about. Now, and I know you've written about this a great deal, but there's dogfight games and there's raid scale air games, and you mm -hmm. distinguish those not only from strategic, but even from operational. So, you know, what, what makes something a, a raid scale game, and, and why were you drawn to that for your, for your big project? Okay, I mean, I, I think we're getting into into terminology here, and I I have adopted a personal terminology uh, which may differ from other people's when it comes to this, um, because I think games that are larger than the dogfight scale games people tend to call operational, and I actually think that um, that's an inaccurate description. Uh, I call them. I mean, I call them raid scale games, or you could call them grand tactical games if you really wanted. Um, but I think they are, 
are uh, they are an intermediate point between an operational air game and uh, and what you could call the the dogfight scale, which is the truly the tactical um, uh, uh, game. And so the race scale game is, as it suggests, it is the uh, it is about a raid. Um, perhaps multiple raids going on simultaneously, but generally speaking, it's about about the execution of a single raid um, in a reasonable amount of detail. So you're talking quite large numbers of aircraft operating in formations, possibly with uh, you know synergies going on between aircraft that do uh, that have very different roles in that raid. I mean, most obvious in sort of World War Two is the the synergies between sort of um, uh, escorts and sweeps and um, the bombers but then you get into the sort of the jet era in Vietnam and all of a sudden you've got uh, a whole bunch of different players you've got uh, electronic warfare aircraft you've got um, uh, suppression of enemy air defenses uh, aircraft uh, and and all these sort of specialists with various different um, uh, uh, roles in the, the whole mission and so I think that the, the interesting thing for me for, for downtown was that it was in some ways about the evolution of that uh, kind of grand tactical um, uh, 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 experience, as it were, um, uh, resolving missions, uh, uh, resolving raid packages that may consist of bombers and escorts and sweeps and SEAD and electronic warfare aircraft and frick and frack. Um, and ha how these things all come together against an integrated air defense system. And uh, th th so there's, a, there's several things going on there. I think it's partly it's just the, the mixture of different forces with different roles, but also the asymmetry between a attacker and defender uh, that were, you know, obviously a, a big attraction there to, to focus on that, on the raid. And that I think is very, very separate from operations which is a, a a wholly different thing. I mean, I, I, when I look at what operations really are in, a, in an aviation sense, they are not about resolving individual raids. They are about campaigns. And so they are about um, really fundamental things like uh, uh, basing, sortie generation, um, uh, uh logistics and uh you know airlift and all sorts of other things and a much much larger scale uh, and it, that's an area of game that i don't think well i can think of one game that has managed to tackle it um it doesn't really get covered in uh much detail by games and um, perhaps one day i'll get around to cracking that particular puzzle i've got mm -hmm. some i've got some designs for doing that but um it's just a case of getting around to doing them so I think, I mean, you are admirably strict as a game designer. I mean, I'm thinking about myself as, as, a, as a designer also, and I think you are, you are more um, disciplined than I am in defining the roles of the players and drawing those boundaries realistically, for example, not allowing your um, planners to, not allowing the raid planners who are putting together the strike packages and the routes and the like mm -hmm. to choose the targets for that day that comes from higher higher headquarters. And it has a, uh, it, it, clearly that's worked because downtown was indeed very popular and has spawned a whole series of, of games based on on that scale and that system. Yeah, can, and that. can I talk about that just for a moment? I, I think there's something sure. quite interesting there. I mean, I, I think there are a number of fundamentals to um, design, at least the way I design anyway. Uh, I'm sure other people have different ways of designing. Um, I think there are a number of really fundamental things you have to decide very, very early on. I mean, one of those things is what are the victory conditions? I think you know it's a very important consideration and we're going to get to that I think when we start talking about the burning blue in a little bit um, but uh, I think the the other is what I call the, the, the hats problem is what hats do people wear uh, and it's, it's a fact it's a fact that most war games uh, the, the player uh, wears multiple hats now by hat I mean you know what role are you playing well I mean if, uh, if I'm in a dogfight game actually in some ways a dogfight game is one of the purest because if I'm playing a dogfight game with a single fighter, then I've got one hat and it's of that pilot. But uh, if I'm in a, f a flight, I might have two, three, four hats um, simultaneously. But then it's not just the, the hat number of hats you're wearing with ways, it's the number of hats you're wearing vertically in the command chain. Um, and so 
it is quite common, for example, for games uh, for you to be a division commander, but you're also controlling your brigade, so you're a brigade commander, and you might even be pushing around battalions, so you're a battalion commander. And so you're wearing, you know, two or three hats on top of each other, and, and after a while, a number of hats get so tall that it becomes un unwieldy. Uh, and what you're actually doing is you're not, uh, you, you are demonstrating a level of coordination um, that simply d did not exist historically, if it's, hi if it's a historical game. Um, and, uh, you know, your, your model starts to break down in some ways. Uh, now, a lot of games tend to kind of like get around this by putting in various rules for adding friction in some ways between the command levels. You know, it's a lot of command and control rules and so on. But in some ways, what they're trying to do with those is so is recognize the fact that you have multiple hats on and actually um, those multiple hats don't always work um, in, in unison. Mm. Uh, the, you know, division commander and brigade commanders maybe, uh, you know, have very different things going on for them. And you said that there was something to say about this that we could discuss with regard to the victory conditions in the burning blue. And well, what is that? Oh, Lordy, I mean, we're starting to get into the burning blue now. The, the burning blue has a problem. And uh, I will admit to being a complete coward in the way that I, I got around it. In fact, it's the same problem that downtown had. And, um, and so the, 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 the essential problem is that um, uh, uh, I'm, tr I'm trying to think about is what are what are the victory conditions? What are the victory conditions, and how does that just drive the decision making in um, a, a particular game? Um, and a problem with the with the Battle of Britain is that when you come to looking at the Germans and modelling the Germans. Um, it's incredibly difficult to define their victory conditions. What are the victory conditions for the Germans? Um, because I looked at this problem and though you could probably define some very, very loose, very, very high level hand waving um, uh, concepts, like we achieve air superiority so that we can launch a channel crossing, for example. What does that actually mean? How do you define that? What does what is that that thing? And then you have to, then have to look at how the Germans went about it, and how they went about it was is as is, is was 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 lunacy in some ways. It, it bore very little relation to uh, it, it lacked coherency their their scheme. Um, there is a there is a book on the Battle of Britain that I hate. Um, uh, it's called uh, The Most Dangerous Enemy, and it's by this man called Stephen Bungay, um, who I dislike. Uh, I've seen him on television. He's this kind of oily um, cove, and I, I really don't like him. He's um, a management consultant by trade uh, who's started writing history books. And uh, it, it, the, the Most Dangerous Enemy suffers from... Uh, the, the problems an awful lot of amateur histories uh, in that it, it just it's all over the shop. I mean, at one stage he goes off on this very long wibble about the Spitfire as the avatar of Eros or something. It's 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 a, it's a terrible book. However, in its favour, it has a couple of things going for it. One is that that Bungay can at least speak German, and he's clearly been footling around in the German archives. And so, if you're, you're prepared to dig in there, and particularly into the footnotes, there are a couple of gems to be found. The other thing is that when he gets onto the bit he knows and understands, which is management consultancy, he's actually got something interesting to say. And, uh, you know, he, what he basically says is, uh, you know, to, to put it in, in shorthand, uh, the RAF were professionals and the Luftwaffe were amateurs. And I think there's, there's something to that. Um, this was a very curious time in the history of air warfare. There had been in the 1930s an awful lot of theorizing, or from the 20s through to the 30s, a lot of theorizing as to what the future air war would be like. Plus, of course, there had been, you know, all these airmen had been very keen on hoovering up as many, um, you know, dollars or pounds or Deutschmarks to spend on, um, on, on building their own little, little aviation empires and trying to find a role for themselves. Well, I mean, their role in World War I had largely been army support. 
you know, been artillery spotting, it had been um, reconnaissance, uh, taking photographs, it had been um, close air support. In fact, the, the, the British had a very, very well developed close air support system by the end of the Great War, which was then promptly forgotten because uh, everybody became obsessed with the whole idea of, you know, wars being able to be won through coercion, coercion from the air alone. And you have these kind of like Trenchardian, Duhettian, um, uh, uh, Mitchell characters coming along and uh, with, with their, their with the sort of um, various prophecies and uh, and tracts uh, insisting that you know war could be won with gas bombs and so on in a in hours uh, from the air and some of their math didn't add up but there's, there's quite a lot of stuff going on here and then, and then you get to the 1930s and then there's there's something else starts happening as well which is that the technical development in aviation starts accelerating at a furious rate uh, a lot of new technologies come in, um, in particular with engine technologies. Engines become an awful lot more powerful in a very, very short period of time. Um, high performance becomes possible both for bombers and for fighters. Uh, and, and uh, you know, uh, people are just trying to figure out how the hell, how the hell do we um, fight an air war? And the truth is that, that people didn't really know. They didn't really understand um, there was a lot of ideas and there's a lot of, a lot of uh, development and wargaming and various things that kind of eventually converged at what we end up, ended up with in World War II. But in, still in the very early stages, in 1940, people were still trying to work things out. Um, you know, a lot of theories about strategic bombing hadn't yet been completely debunked. I mean, after all, Rotterdam had been seen to work. Um, you know, the Germans drop, dropped a whole bunch of bombs on Rotterdam, the, the, the Dutch surrendered. They dropped a whole bunch of bombs on Warsaw and, uh, you know, the Poles suffered accordingly. So, um, yeah, there, there, there's an awful lot of, an awful lot in, in terms of doctrine, both at the, the strategic level and the operational level and the tactical level that people hadn't really figured out. I mean, one of my favorite stories, I mean, and it does relate to the Battle of Britain indeed, is, is that of the turret fighters. And I'm sure you, you're, you're, you're aware of, of the turret fighters, the Defiant, um, for example, which, which did actually fight very briefly. Mainly in, from Burning uh, Blue, yes. <laughs> uh, it did fight very briefly and then uh, it got hammered quite horribly and uh, then was withdrawn from, from combat. But it, the, the, a lot of people sort of go, why the hell did the RAF invest so much in turret fighters? Well, it, came, it comes down to really... The, the British, like everybody else, are trying to figure out how to fight an air war. What tools did you need to fight an air war? And you, you start looking at the 1930s and what they're expect, expecting the Battle of Britain to look like. And there's this, of these competing visions. For a very long time, the, uh, the, the British were, were torn between two designs of fighter, uh, which were very, very different from each other. One was a, was a kind of pure interceptor, very short range, very high speed, um, uh, which for various technical reasons meant a sort of lower rate of climb. But the idea was that it was able to scramble once a, a raid had been detected, um, hunt out the uh, the enemy quite quickly and, and, and deal them a, a death blow. And then uh, the other kind of concept really was for a different kind of fighter, which was for something that was actually very slow, um, but had a very high rate of climb because it was probably a biplane and uh but uh, but also had very long endurance and so it was a patrol fighter essentially so it could go up it could have these very very long patrols and uh and therefore be if you like you know the first line of defense against any kind of bombing raids coming in and, and these these ideas slowly became whittled down and whittled down and whittled down over uh, over time until you don't they kind of disappear and you just have the interceptor uh, concept is is the thing that we recognize in, in the form of the, the, the hurricane and the spitfire which starts emerging really sort of like 36 37 as, as concepts um, but also at the same time they had they, they had this this problem of how do we engage the defended bomber it was sort of axiomatic at that in that time that the the bomber the bomber because it was a big multi-engined aircraft was going to be very very fast so the fighters would have difficulty catching them um, that they would be, they would have flexible guns or turreted guns and therefore would be um, well defended. And so one of the things they did was they did some wargaming. 
And what that wargaming revealed was that, um, that, that fighters would have an enormous problem downing bombers. And the reason being was that the bombers outgunned the fighters. Uh, and the reasoning really was this, and it was based on a false assumption. It was based on experience from World War I with, uh, with um, uh, the Bristol Fighter which is one of the, the you know, one of the most famous um, RFC aircraft from the, the Great War, which was essentially a, a fighter with a, with a, a flexible gun mount in the back. And, um, uh, and it, it proved to be quite successful. Uh, and those assumptions, the, the assumption that was used in the war game was that, uh, the, that a flexible mounted gun was worth twice a fixed gun on a fighter. And so uh, given this basic numerical assumption, and also given that the, the idea that, of course, fighters with fixed weapons could only attack one at a time against a bomber, they, the math kind of worked out that, the, that a squadron of fighters attacking a bomber would essentially be defeated in detail by the bomber's superior firepower. And so what you needed to do was mass large numbers of bombers, as large numbers of fighters, to tackle the bombers. But then you still have this same problem of the fighters can only attack bombers one at a time without you know crashing into each other and so from this they came up with this alternate idea of well what if we just had a turret fighter and we just flew it into formation with the bombers and uh, possibly a bit below maybe in a blind spot for the bombers where where its flexible guns can't fire and then we get the flexible gun advantage and we can down the bombers lick lickety split and so you get this, this, this you, you see from this little, little story how people were still figuring out how stuff worked. And, uh, you know, it was all based on a series of assumptions. I mean, the assumption of the turret fighter was, for example, well, the German bombers are going to be coming from Germany. They're not going to be coming from France. And so, of course, they're going to be unes unescorted. And so, of course, our turret fighter is going to be able to fly into formation with the... Um, with these bombers and down them with their superior uh, rifle caliber machine guns and they hadn't taken into account that for example the uh, you know the, the germans might end up coming from france um that uh, they would have escorts and that actually rifle caliber machine guns might be entirely inadequate for the, the task and uh, you might need cannon so all these sort of things you know kind of uh, uh, you know show, give an illustration for how people were still figuring things out and actually to be fair to them a lot of that stuff was being resolved even in the late late 30s and 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 the conclude you know the, the product of that which was the hurricane and spitfire you know speak for themselves in terms of of of, of their quality um but you know the germans had a very similar story with their their the stories the, with the bf um uh 110s yeah and so uh, again, that was a concept um, for a you know a fast uh, a, a fast uh, uh, fighter. We're carrying lots of heavy armament, um, and uh, you know as a concept, it, it, it made made a lot of sense to people. Now, I have to say that the uh, BFM one has got a kind of a bad rap. In fact, I think in the Burning Blue, I kind of rated it quite poorly. Um, I think nowadays I would rate it much more highly. Um, there's been some interesting research. Uh, Christa Bergstrom, for example, has got a quite decent book out on the Battle of Britain where he re-examines the BF110 record and suggests that actually it was a lot better than um, we tend to give it credit for. That it carried, you know, it was a fast aircraft in terms of performance. It was only, only a little slower than a, a, a BF109. Um, it... Uh, it carried a very big gun battery, um, and if it was used, you know, effectively, offensively, it was a, you know, very, very effective fighter. And in fact, what were the, the few occasions that we see the 110s getting massacred were, were actually when they were at a big disadvantage, such as the 15th of August raid on the north of England, when they were flying with these, these big... Um, uh, drop tanks. I forgot what they call them now, but they had these big bolt-on drop, drop tanks, which weren't actually drop tanks at all because they they couldn't oh, drop man. them. Yeah, and so um, and so they were they, they were massively disadvantaged when they were caught over uh, over the northeast of England uh, by Spitfires and Hurricanes. So, um, but you know, things like the BFM one was still generally thought to be a failure as a as a high performance fighter, and certainly as the war went on. And it didn't really get the engine upgrades and didn't really get the, the big 
boost in performance that the uh, the single engine fighters did and fell behind and so ended up basically moving into other roles as a bomber destroyer or uh, as a night fighter so i wanted to um take back take you back to that issue you raised of operation historically operational incoherence or strategic incoherence as a as a game design challenge and, and see if we can't wrap in downtown as well because there is the certainly Rolling Thunder as a campaign has a reputation of not being particularly coherent or, or effective. And so how, how did you, putting the players in those roles, how did you solve that for, game, for design of a game that's supposed to be fun and competitive in terms of victory conditions? Burning blue uh, I was a coward and I, I took the easy way out um, in both, both of those games. I, I took very much the same sort of approach really. Um, the uh, sorry, I did. I go on off on a bit wibble there about uh, about aircraft for a moment, but uh, uh, you, you, excuse me, the ramble. But it, it does sort of fit into in somewhat into the way that the Germans operated in in the Battle of Britain. Is that it's very hard to to, to divine coherence in terms of uh, doctrine and strategy. Um, what was the German game plan? It, it's really hard to define. I mean, there's, there's various anecdotes, for example, of Kesselring. Um, uh, essentially um, crossing off airfields every time one was bombed uh, which if true is is nuts the whole idea that somehow you could you could suppress an air force um, just by raiding each one of its airfields once without restrikes is uh, is is lunacy and nobody would countenance that kind of thing these days you know you you if you you're going to ensure degradation of capability you're going to be mounting restrikes against you know those airfields or those those installations or facilities or whatever you're going to make sure the job gets done um uh, and there was, certainly seems to be an awful lot of that kind of thing that was going on i mean some airfields were struck more than others um uh, but some weren't hit hardly at all uh but yeah again there's there's things like for example the the um campaign against the radar system the germans knew about the radar system they absolutely knew about it they knew what its value was and yet when you actually i actually sat down and i counted up the number of sorties that were launched against the the um the radar uh, installations it's tiny it's it's minuscule in fact, if, if anything, many of the games that have been made on the subject overstate the amount of effort that the Germans put into suppressing the, the radar. They, it was a very half-hearted attempt. Um, and so, uh, really, the way I got around it around this was, was that I, I couldn't divine rhyme nor reason to Luftwaffe strategy. I looked at the raids. If you notice, I actually plotted what they did. And that research found its way into, into the burning blue. And um, I still haven't, even these years later, uh, really divined what that particular game plan was, what they're attempting to do, except that there was, you know, clearly an escalation of effort and there clearly was an escalation um, further inland in, in terms of the targeting. And what you really see is that the, the boundaries of, of uh, how far the, uh, how deep the Germans were prepared to raid were pushed further and further back you know you, you start with the first phase of the battle which is essentially the canal camp and uh, they're, they're hitting hitting aircraft uh, hitting um, convoys in the channel and they're hitting some targets um, essentially on the coast and then you go move through to the second phase you've got eagle day and you know you you're still, still really attacking the coast maybe some little bit further inland but it doesn't really go that far inland it's only really the third phase that things start getting deep and then you, of course you get the fourth phase which is the raids on london where where the, the the depth of raiding is at its greatest and also at the same time the exposure of bombers to the defenses the air defenses is at its greatest and that's really the point at which you see you know the casualties casualty rates spike and, and, the, the and those four phases are your scenarios one two three and four in the burning yeah. course so a player and, can go through all that yeah, and then, then of course they, they decide to go away, and uh, you know it's like uh, yeah, they pick up, picked up their ball and, and, and went home essentially uh, for the fifth phase of the battle. I mean, the, the, the Germans don't really talk about the Battle of Britain. It was just a thing that happened between the completion of the, the conquest of France and them wanting to launch their assault on Russia. You know, it was just it, it was there. It happened. Um, you know, they don't really make a very big deal about it in any of their histories. Um, 
Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's obviously it's become this, this major part of British national mythology, quite poisonous in its own way, but that's a, a, a talk for another time. But uh, yes, essentially you, you have, um, uh, it's a very, very hard to define um, exactly what they what they were attempting to do. My sense is that they were figuring out how air campaigns worked. Up to this point, they had been, "All oh, right, we're we're an army support, you know, um, uh, aviation um, outfit. We, you know, our job is to support the army." And all of a sudden, it now found itself in a, "All oh, right, we're in, we're getting to the strategic bombing game. How does that work?" Well, of course, we read Douay. We we kind of know how this is supposed to work. And oh, that playbook's not really working. So what should we do? And then, you know, they're clearly experimenting with with various ideas, and it all culminates on uh, you know, all oh, right, let's so let's hit the the the, Lon the you know London stocks and let's try and uh, let's try and really work the the economic stranglehold on the British, uh, which ended up turning into the Blitz and everything else and indiscriminate bombing. Uh, and of course, I grew up with all these stories because my parents had had been evacuated at the start of war and had returned just in time for the Battle of Britain and the Blitz. So um, I grew up with all the stories of them being bombed and, you know, my mother being um, uh, strafed by Messerschmitts and, uh, and all sorts of stuff. My dad watching uh, watching um, uh, chimney pots on the rooftops be shot off by low-flying hurricanes and things chasing after Heinkels. And so, uh, you know, all, all fun stories. Um, uh, you know, part of my, my sort of, you know, family's per personal uh, mythology. Uh, so, but anyway, so like I say, I kind of got around the, uh, the the problem by just not tackling it, not tackling what the strategy was and just simply going, right, okay, this is what the Germans did. Pick one of these, pick this raid, pick that raid. Well, you, you use random chits to pick what the raids are, but essentially they are historical raids. You get to randomly pick them and you get to replay essentially a little episode from um, the actual historical battle. And that seemed like the best way of doing it. And, and downtown was kind of organized in a very similar fashion. It was, you know, these were the targets that were hit in this particular phase of the, of, of the campaign. Uh, you pick one of these targets or it's picked for you and then you just execute that particular raid. So what, Lee, what alternatives do you see to that? I mean, you say you took a path. Uh, is there another path that, that, that um, would be more interesting in some way? Um, I, uh, there possibly is, but I, I haven't found it and I haven't seen it. Now, the Battle of Britain, as aviation game subjects go, is one of the most gamed subjects. I, I've, play, I've either owned or played innumerable um, games on the subject. Uh, and they were all for me the wrong scale. They, they, were, they were all problematic because of the hats problem. They were trying to do too many things, too many hats. Um, it's, it's actually worth just diverting onto this for a second before I, I get back to the main thread. But Please. one of the things about the Battle of Britain is if you've ever seen a Battle of Britain movie, if you've ever seen Angels 1 5, if you've ever seen The Battle of Britain, the film, uh, the most, most abiding images is of, you know, a big ops table somewhere in a bunker with wafts, uh, with croupier sticks, pushing things around on it. And it looks like a war game. It absolutely looks like a war game. And you want to go, I want to play that. And almost none of the games until the Burning Blue did that. A lot of them tried to do a kind of a mishmash of strategic, uh, you know, of, of strategy and the tactical side. In, in some ways, they were tackling the true operational scale problem if, of, you know, we generate sorties, we launch raids against these targets. And at, the, at the same time, they wanted to try and resolve the individual raids and so on. And you get kind of get the, the this sort of mashup of these um uh, of these sort of different scales and wearing all these different hats now uh, john butterfield who is twice the designer i'll ever be uh, possibly even a larger multiple than that has tackled this subject three times now maybe, maybe four I've, I've lost track of how many battle of britain games he's, he's made um and has has done an absolutely admirable job 
but even he's run into the problem of you know how do you what do you do with the germans and the the problem you end up with is that the, the germans in those games and even in butterfield's games i fear um end up being far more coherent if they've got a player running them than the actual historical germans were and i'm not really sure i know a way around it i mean to be fair to butterfield he did find a way around it in that he kind of did a little bit what i did with the first edition of raf it was like all oh, right the germans are the germans are a bot they're card generated bot but it was very very interesting because i did discuss this when he, he went with him when he was making the his version 2.0 of the game and uh, you know we discussed a whole whole bunch of things on the on the design and um I think that certainly the initial version of that version 2.0, when you actually had a player in charge of the Germans, the Germans were, I think, again, far too coherent. It was far too easy for them to coordinate in a way they never did historically. Not just the two Luftflotters, but just, you know, in terms of planning and the strategy and, and you know, how do we win this thing? Um, uh, and uh, and I think since then, uh, uh, John's had to patch the game and patch that system to make it a little bit tougher for for the Germans. And it, it comes down to, again, that fundamental question that every game designer has to ask himself right at the beginning is what are the victory conditions? What are the victory conditions for the Germans? I've looked at this problem for years now, for over 20 years, and I'll be buggered if I know what what the victory conditions for the Germans are. Because we know historically that, you know, bombing via, you know, a coercive bombing doesn't work. So what do the Germans have to do to get a victory condition, which means defining what that victory looks like? Is that victory getting a bunch of, uh, you know, a bunch of the German army across the channel on rafts? Um, or, or, or what is it? I don't know. Um, so so at the uh, the raid scale in, in 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 your games, if you're the attacker, if you're the look buff in the burning blue or the U.S. in downtown, you're assigned your targets, and your job is to bomb those targets effectively with a reasonable amount of attrition, and that's your that's your 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 objective yep. as the player. And so that raises a, a a question I have for you in terms of whether you thought about this in design, just from a gameplay perspective, and for players naturally who want to do well and have control of their destinies and win and beat their friends and that sort of thing. And uh, you can fly in, you can do an elaborate plan or a simple plan, whatever, you do your plan, you fly in as the attacker, and in the burning blue, your navigation goes uh, awry, you're lost and you bomb a decoy and don't make a lot of points. Uh, or in the downtown, sometimes you bomb badly and maybe one Sam happened to hit one of your jets and, and you lose. And did, did, did it did you think about as you were designing, um, answering a reaction from players like, well, you know, that's very realistic and maybe it feels like Vietnam or it feels like, you know, Luftwaffe incoherence, but you know, darn it all, I, I just got unlucky and, and I've spent a lot of hours, you know, and then I got lost and didn't bomb. <laughs> yes, I, I think there is a kind of a, there's a genre of game that I think you, we can call the experience game in that it's about generating a particular kind of experience rather than necessarily ludic satisfaction. I think a lot of my games and I think particularly, you know, downtown and burning blue fit into that. You know, it is the burning blue to a certain extent is me wanting to do, wanting to have the experience of being the 11 group controller um, you know, defending against raids that are forming up and, uh, you know, deploying my forces accordingly. Um, or, you know, or the, the, the American, you know, raid package planner who is, uh, you know, just essentially plans his raid and then, then you kind of see, you, you, you wind up the toy and you let it go and then you kind of see how it all plans out. It, it just they, runs off on its rails and you get to see your opponent react to it. Yeah, I mean, because I kind of come with this because I'm very interested in the history and, and I'm quite, I'm personally quite happy with that, uh, with that approach. Um, in in the, the video games business, we have what we call market segmentation. I, th I think pretty much every large corporation I've ever worked for has had different definitions of market segmentation, but it already comes down to the same, same kinds of thing, which is you identify different types of player. 
and your audience you know a person may be of one more than one type of player and um, not everybody is the same and so some people want to some people are, are in a video game because they want to achieve um, or they want to just explore what the game possibility is or they want to do a social have a social time or they want to you know just have you know some other kind of experience and I think certainly my games the market segment is people who quite like history and want to have an experience and if you want ludic satisfaction um, it might be lacking in my games sorry yeah, it's it's a great point, <clears throat> and I think that it's it's so hard when uh, you know you go to BGG and get a host of comments from a host of different types of gamers on on how much fun a game is, right? And 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 as I as I sit in the RAF chair playing Burning Blue, uh, I feel very much like I, I don't know the sector the the commander might feel in in making a decision: do I launch or do I not launch? Uh, how big is the raid? What's the composition? What's the right timing for me? Those are fantastic uh, decisions to have to make, knowing the history. Now, is it is it is it uh, is it balanced? Is the victory points appropriate? Who cares, right? But because I I get I get stuck in that situation where I have to make uh, make those choices. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think if you come out of it thinking, okay, I I've had. I get a sense of how um, this 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 battle plays now. I get I've got I've learned some history from it. I was like you know I I've got a narrative, and that narrative was seemed authentic and interesting and enjoyable. Um, then I, I think I've done my job uh, as a designer there. Um, if you were going into it going well, I, you know this is, doesn't feel finely balanced, or you know I had a couple of critical die rolls go against me, and uh, I had a kind of sucky experience as a consequence, then I'm, I'm kind of sorry about that. But the game is what it is. I made it that way <laughs> um, to to because it was the game I wanted to play, and the game I wanted to play was me as eleven group controller. <laughs> 